Well, good morning again. So, if you've been keeping track, uh, you'll know that we just have two more sermons on this series we've been involved in for some time now on basic apologetics. Next week, Denny will do somewhat of a summary, connect all the dots, fill in what we missed, and stress again the importance of the material. He might only need 15 or 20 minutes for that, or he might need two or three hours. It's hard to say at this point. So today I want to address the question, why isn't the evidence more clear, more pronounced, more decisive? And it kind of seems maybe like a silly question, given that we have just spent 13 weeks laying out a lot of evidence. Though the material we presented was pretty basic, it was nonetheless, I believe, quite compelling. And for the one who wants to dig deeper, of course, there are, there's just simply no shortage of books that deal with all of those arguments that we presented and even more that we didn't present, and they deal with them quite comprehensively. But yet we all run into people um, all the time who just remain unsatisfied. They just want more. They're kind of like that belligerent member of the jury who refuses to convict unless he has it all. You know, he wants the smoking gun. He wants the DNA evidence. He wants a dozen witnesses to the crime and a videotape of the whole thing and a written confession, notarized. You know, he's just too lazy to weigh the evidence that has been presented and too much of a malcontent to accept the truth of that evidence. Now, in the past, you might remember that we have sometimes referred to the famous complaint from Carl Sagan, the late atheist astronomer, who once asked, why isn't there a glowing cross in the sky at night to serve as irrefutable proof of Jesus' resurrection. And Bertrand Russell, an atheist who regarded any sort of religion as not just superstition, but actually dangerous, harmful, once, was once asked what he would say to God on Judgment Day if indeed Christianity proved to be true. And Russell said that he would respond to God's question, why didn't you believe, with not enough evidence, God, not enough evidence. But it's not just atheists and skeptics. This is probably a question that all of us have wondered about. You know, surely God wants everyone to believe in him and follow his ways. Why hasn't he done more to show himself to us? Have you ever wondered about that? And this especially comes to mind when we pray for someone facing a terminal illness. We're praying that they will be healed. And we think to ourselves that such a miracle would, would serve to do so many good things. You know, not only will the loved one be spared of his suffering, but... His unsaved family members and friends would see firsthand a demonstration of God's power. It's a perfect opportunity for God to show himself. But yet he, he doesn't. The person dies, and those who are lost remain lost. You know, if only. Why didn't he? Ten years ago, Nate Elkington addressed some of this in a sermon he titled, The Hiddenness of God. You might remember it. He was dealing mostly with the problem of, of, of believers who struggle with what is typically called emotional doubt, but many of the same principles on this apply. Overall, I find the question kind of an intriguing one, and, and though all illustrations break down at some point, I have found some illustrations in particular to be especially helpful for this, with this subject, and I'll be using them today, and hopefully you will find them helpful as well. As I see it, the question, why isn't the evidence clearer, is based on at least four assumptions that most people have. They're common assumptions. They're held by both, by both non-Christians and Christians. But upon a closer look, each of these four assumptions simply fail to hold water. They are, they are false. And so that's our mission this morning. We will look at each of the four and dismantle them. And um, I expect some of the material to be familiar. You probably have heard bits and pieces of these sorts of things throughout the years. So the plan for today is simply address all this in a systematic way. All right? We will package everything up neatly in a nice square box, all those assumptions, and then we will burn them. All right? <laughs> so let's dive into it. When the question is asked, why isn't the evidence more impressive well, that question assumes that the evidence we do have for Christianity isn't enough, that it's too little and or too weak. And that's why we need something like a glowing cross in the sky. And the first thing that comes to mind on this is, well, what would be enough? Whatever that might be, a determined skeptic will, of course, find some way to, even ex to explain even that away. Even a glowing cross up in the sky can be explained away. 
And one might as well ask, why doesn't God have his own television channel? Or a Zoom account, where people could access him online and talk to him one-on-one. -on -one. Or just appear in person whenever he is summoned. Many people would believe if every, maybe people would believe if every molecule had the word stamped on it, made by God. Well, these examples, of course, are silly, but people tend to want something scientific and certain, something, you know, like CSI agents can analyze in a laboratory. It's kind of like demanding a person to go into space and bring back a galaxy to Earth to study before one can really be sure that there is such a thing as a galaxy. The problem, of course, isn't that the evidence is lacking, that not enough is available. You know what the problem is. It's one's disposition toward the evidence that is available. Jesus talked about this in one of his parables, Lazarus and the rich man. If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. If they don't believe in the evidence they do have, which is compelling, that's the point Jesus is making, then they won't believe even if presented with something dramatic and spectacular. Again, the evidence for Christianity is more than sufficient, as we have seen in this series, and indeed, someone actually did rise from the dead. What's more impressive than that? So it's kind of like standing before the judge, claiming that if the city really didn't want motorists to drive over 30 miles an hour, they would post bigger signs, and they would be brighter and bolder, and there'd be more of them, like one every four feet, grabbing one's attention with spotlights and loud horns and dancing girls and all that stuff, you know. I mean, no judge is going to be amused by that. Another problem is that when it comes to religious claims, many people tend to apply a standard that they don't apply to anything else in life. Unless they are presented with 100% proof, then they just won't believe. But nothing is 100% certain. Virtually all of our decisions are based on logical probability, not mathematical certainty, many of which are decisions where our very lives are at stake. We ride on elevators. We fly in airplanes. We eat food prepared by others. We swallow pills, not really knowing what's in them. We drive through green lights, assuming the other person's going to stop at the red light. We strap ourselves into roller coasters. We submit ourselves to the surgeon's knife. We do these things and so much more, none of which enjoy the confidence of being 100% certain of, of its safety. Elevators fall. Airplanes crash. Mistakes happen all the time with medicine. People fall out of roller coasters and die during surgeries. We make decisions, you and I, even risky ones, based on the logical probability of it being the right one. So this last Thursday, the Hubbards invited us over for uh, Thanksgiving, and there was a high logical probability that the food we ate would not make us sick and result in our deaths, all right? But admittedly, I did not watch them make it or question them about the ingredients and if they took the proper sanitary measures when preparing it and so on. I did not send the food out to a lab for testing. And given that they were going to eat the same food I was, it was logically probable to assume that it would be safe. This is how we process all of our decisions. The best explanation of the facts, you know, given all that I know, is that this particular elevator at this particular time is safe to ride. And so it is with Christianity. Do we have a videotape of the resurrection of Jesus? No. Can I send Jesus a text and ask him to come by and show me one-on-one -on -one his resurrected body? No. Nope. Can we? Well, I can do that, but he's going to respond. <laughs> you're, so te you're so technical. <laughs> Can we prove that it happened with mathematical certainty? No, we can't. Is it logically probable? Well, it does require one to believe that a miracle took place, but it is, after all, the best explanation of all the facts we have. And given all the evidence, it is the reasonable thing to believe. And, at the, and the same with all the other arguments, as many as they are, for not just for the existence of God, but also for the Christian faith itself. Uh, the totality of which is quite impressive. And to demand more should strike us as not just unnecessary, but even a bit arrogant. It's kind of like someone who needs a car but doesn't have the money to buy one. And so his uncle gives 
offers to give him his brand new Lexus, but he turns it down because he thinks he is entitled to something more luxurious. Is this uncle obligated to accommodate him? Is not the whole thing rather insulting? So remember the time when Pilate sent Jesus to be tried by Herod. Herod kept badgering Jesus to perform a miracle, and it became obvious that he'd had no intention of embracing Jesus as the, as the Messiah, the Son of God. He simply wanted to be amused. He wanted to be indulged. And so it is with many skeptics today. They reject the evidence that has been provided, demanding that God would indulge them so that he would accommodate, you know, that he would accommodate them by meeting their standards of proof. But God is under no obligation to do that. What has been provided is more than sufficient and nothing more is needed. Again, the problem, I would argue, is not the evidence, but one's disposition toward the evidence. Along that line is another false assumption, very similar to this first one here, that without absolute proof, it is foolish to believe. Only fools would believe in unicorns, Bigfoot, leprechauns, Easter Bunny, and miracles. You know, get with the science. Don't be an idiot. And so the proof has to be perfect. It has to be absolute. It has to be airtight. So let me ask you, can we prove anything absolutely? Can we really prove perfectly, absolutely, that those swirls of dots we see in telescopes are actually distant galaxies? Unless we bring one back to Earth and examine it in a science lab, can we be absolutely sure? Now, for that matter, can I give you perfect proof that you are now sitting in this warm room? It is warm, right? With all these other wonderful people around you. They are wonderful, correct? Listening to a how shall we say, charming and sensitive and compassionate and endearing speaker. Amen. Amen. <laughs> is, it, is it logically, is all this logically probable? It is logically probable, but even this is not mathematically certain. Not as long as other possibilities exist. And there is a, a small chance a very slight possibility that you are actually a bluebird sitting in a tree daydreaming this whole thing. How can you rule that out? Perfect, perfect proof on anything is virtually impossible. There is always a way to raise some doubt about it, whatever it is. Skeptics, however, don't demand absolute proof to back up other things they believe, and so it is hypocritical for them to, de to demand it here. Again, they ride elevators, they fly on airplanes, they eat food prepared by others, they trust the bridge going over the railroad. They even accept atheism, or at least agnosticism, without absolute proof. Therefore, the best way to frame this, I believe, is in terms of degrees of proof, based on the weight of evidence. And like anything, some evidence will be more persuasive and therefore have more weight. And at the end of the day, it will come down to what is the best explanation of all that we know. Which option is the most probable logically? The other part of this assumption is this business about being foolish. That it's foolish to believe in Christianity, unless the proof is absolute. Foolish, I suppose, because you will be asked to embrace a lifestyle that admittedly calls for a lot of self-denial. And um, if it's not true, it would all be for nothing. You know, all these heavy requirements about loving enemies. I mean, that's a deal stopper right there. You know, putting others first, forgiving offenders, sharing with those in need, restraining sinful desires, controlling your anger, dying to self, and more. I mean, that's a lot to ask. And so we need absolute proof that such sacrifices will be worth it. I'm not going to waste my life living for a lie. Well, that would be one way to look at it. Others might frame it a little differently and say it this way. The greater the claim, the greater the burden to prove it. And the claim here is great. Lots of miracles, a resurrection from the dead, a man who claims to be God in the flesh, life after death, and more. That's a lot to ask someone to accept. And so the evidence better be impressive. But given what is at stake, it would seem that the more accurate way to look at this would be a more accurate way to look at it would be this. The more severe the consequences, the less we should take risks. The more severe the consequences, the less we should take risks. 
As foolish as that as it might be to embrace a lifestyle of self-denial if Christianity is false, it is certainly not as foolish as rejecting Christianity if it is true. Even if the evidence for biblical Christianity were pathetically weak, we should embrace it and live by it because of the possibility of an eternal hell. And given its great torment, well, that is a risk no one should be willing to take. In cases where refusing to believe has consequences, a person does not have the luxury to demand extraordinary evidence, much, especially when sufficient evidence already exists. Consider, for instance, the drastic measures we take upon something like a mere phone call. We, uh, we evacuate buildings and airports and close off traffic for blocks and stop virtually everything immediately upon one anonymous 911 call claiming that there is a bomb. We have no evidence of a bomb. The phone call itself is sufficient to justify the drastic measures. And we as a society, we agree. We all believe that the more severe the consequences, the less we should take risks. Clearly, in many situations, the option of not doing anything is, is not a viable option. Likewise, given the warning about the eternal state of the lost, the stakes are simply too high. Not embracing the gospel is not a safe position where one can claim to be neutral. It is a very dangerous decision. It's anything but safe or neutral. Here we might think of Pascal's wager, something we've talked about in previous years. I think most of you are familiar with it. One should bet, if you will, on what promises the greatest return for the least amount of risk. If you embrace Christianity and it proves to be true, you have gained a joy-filled eternity. But if Christianity isn't true, and then, of course, there's nothing beyond the grave, and so nothing is really lost. If you gain, you gain all. If you lose, you lose nothing. But if you reject it and it is true, the cost, of course, is unbearable. In the end, everyone has to ask himself, is the evidence for the Christian faith so ambiguous and vague and ill-defined that I can safely ignore the warnings about those who reject it? Now, some will point out that Christianity isn't the only game in town making that claim. There are, of course, other religions who say that if you reject them, the consequences will be eternal doom. And so the argument here at first seems like it doesn't have all that much weight. And that would be true if the, if the evidence for Christianity isn't any better than for all these other ones. Indeed, we would have no grounds to call people to embrace it over Islam or Mormonism and so on. And so we have to look at the various claims of each and then choose the one that enjoys the most support for its claims. Pretty simple. So let's illustrate it this way. Let's say that you are on a fifth floor of an office building that catches on fire. The first three floors below are quickly engulfed in flames. And so your only hope is to get to the roof, hoping that there's a way to escape from there. And that's what you do. And it's a seven-story building, and there you are on the roof, 65 feet up, looking for a way uh, to be saved. And you look down on the east side, and there's a group of people yelling at you to jump, promising that you will be okay. And they are convinced that their plan of saving you will work, and so they keep yelling, jump, jump, jump. But, you can, but can you really jump from that far up and land on concrete and expect to survive it? The evidence of the claim isn't all that convincing. And so you run over to the south side of the building. There, people are also yelling, jump, jump, jump. But things there, they look a little more promising, for they have huddled together, and they claim that they will catch you. But can they from seven stories up? And so you run to the west side of the building, and you discover a fire escape running down the outside. This looks promising. From below, another group of people are yelling, take the fire escape, take the fire escape, hurry. This looks to be the best option so far, but even this appears to be too dangerous. Flames are shooting out of the windows, and the fire escape is glowing from all the heat. And so you run to the north side of the building, and below a crowd is yelling, Take the ladder! Take the ladder! And there you see a large fire truck with a long ladder extended all the way up to the roof. A fireman is at the top of it yelling, Come with me! Come with me! Hurry! Well, which, pro which promise of escape, which plan of salvation, if you will, do you choose? Well, the one that looks to be the most sure. Given that the fireman has already climbed up that ladder, it's reasonable to assume, based on logical probability, that the ladder will be safe for you as well. Right? 
Pretty simple illustration. Many religions promise salvation from God's wrath, but when you compare them side by side with the Christian faith, well, which one enjoys the most evidence to support its claims? Which one comes across as the most true? Which one is the one you're willing to trust your life with? Now, in this particular example, the hardened skeptic finds all four options as unsatisfying. In fact, he even denies that there's any danger at all and feels perfectly justified in doing nothing. And this is where his assumption that without absolute proof it is foolish to believe is itself foolish. As with a building on fire, so it is with eternal hell. Given what is at stake, only a fool would require absolute proof before he would believe. The greater the consequences, the less we should take risks. Everyone following me so far? Number three, the third assumption that many people make is this, that if the evidence were clearer, more obvious, more breathtaking, more flashy, then everyone would believe in Christ. Nate Hubbard touched on this a couple weeks ago. Even the most critical skeptic would come to terms with the evidence and be converted is a common thing that people think. And, and, uh, this, and perhaps it's one that we have held to at times, but it, it's simply not true. Some people will not believe, regardless of how impressive and dramatic the proof might appear to be. Talked about this a little bit earlier today. You know, the Israelites who had personally observed the miracles in Egypt, think about them. They had seen those miracles, the, they, the plagues against Pharaoh, they'd watched the parting of the Red Sea, they walked through that, they'd been guided by the pillar of fire, they were fed miraculously each day by the manna from heaven, they saw things that we could only dream about. They repeatedly rejected their faith in God by their worship of idols and sexual immorality and other forms of rebellion. Likewise, we find that the breathtaking and spectacular miracles of Elijah and Elisha were not sufficient to bring the northern kingdom of Israel to repentance. In the Gospel of John, we read about how Jesus healed a blind man and raised Lazarus from the dead. The Jewish leaders still rejected him and, and were even more determined than ever to kill him, even though they could not dispute the genuineness of these miracles. And again, his account of the rich man and a poor man named Lazarus, Jesus makes the point quite clear. The rich man, now in hell, pleads with Abraham to send Lazarus back from the dead to warn his brothers so that they will not face the same torment that he is suffering. But Abraham replies, this is very sobering, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, in other words, the scriptures, they will not be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. God knows and has already demonstrated in history that no matter how clear he makes the evidence, no matter how extraordinary or amazing, it will never be enough for some. More evidence by itself will not convince those whose minds are already set. Maybe they are too prideful to admit that they are wrong or that they need a savior. Maybe there are sinful behaviors they aren't willing to repent from. Maybe they are just too emotionally attached to an opposing view. Whatever the case, no evidence, not even a big cosmic cross glowing in the sky at night, would bring them to their knees. For some, it's simply easier for them to dismiss the existence of God than to submit to him. And generally, quite frankly, this is something we would want to find out early in the conversation. If the person really isn't willing to embrace the gospel, then we're going to have to decide how much time and effort we're going to spend in trying to convince them of it. There are times to present the evidence and persist, and there are times to move on. Take some wisdom and discernment here. Proverbs 23, 9 comes to mind. Don't waste your breath on fools, for they will despise the wisest of advice. Now, a number of years ago, I discovered that a pastor who had once participated with me in some pro-life events had abandoned the faith and was now becoming vocal in attacking the merits of Christianity. Now, this guy was well-educated in both religion and philosophy. He was a graduate of Trinity Evangelical Divinity School with degrees in both a Master's of Divinity and a Master's of Theology, was studying his doctorate. This is the same institution that Josh Miles is enrolled at. And he had studied under William Lane Craig. And this former pastor, of course, was well-versed in apologetics, even writing articles in Christian magazines and teaching others on how to defend the faith. I once ran into him at an apologetic seminar where Craig was speaking. The next time I ran into him a number of years later was at a pool table in Coldwater, Michigan, which is a long story. But that's where I learned about his apostasy. 
And unfortunately, the arguments he once embraced, lived by, and used to evangelize others were now ones he not only rejected, but actually ridiculed and tried to discredit. In fact, he was on a mission to rescue all the dumb and ignorant Christians from the big hoax that they had foolishly bought into. In the years since his deconversion, uh, in the, since his deconversion, he has written several books. They're available on Amazon and other online booksellers. They include titles like Why I Became an Atheist, uh, The Christian Delusion, The Case Against Miracles, Christianity is Not Great, The End of Christianity, Unapologetic, and even a book claiming that Jesus was nothing more than a mythical figure, that there never really was a Jesus of Nazareth. And he's made a name for himself in atheist circles and brags that William Lane Craig refuses to debate him. And I'm quite certain that's not because Craig is afraid to do so. But how could this happen? How could this possibly happen? You know, he knows the strengths of the arguments for Christianity inside out. Are those arguments hollow after all? This whole thing was rather unsettling. And it kind of made me wonder, perhaps I've been duped. I mean, this guy's pretty intelligent. He knows his stuff and walked away from it. What does he know? You know, what's going on here? So upon further interaction with him through emails and by reading um, some of his books, I began to see his, conver- his deconversion from a different light. Several factors were involved that led up to it, and this is key. He had an affair with a co-worker, an ongoing affair that even his church did not know about. He faced ongoing problems in the church he pastored, people getting mad and leaving all the time, and endless conflicts with the elders. The woman he was having an affair with got vindictive and accused him of rape. Uh, Charges were never filed, but it became a real mess in a small community. His reputation was called into question. Eventually, his church fired him. A Bible college he taught at fired him. He didn't feel any passion for his wife anymore, and so he just left her, divorced her. Christian friends and fellow pastors, he complained, began to distance themselves from him. They weren't as chummy as they once were including a cousin that he was very close to, also a pastor, and so on. It's a sad story indeed, but it all seems to have started from his adultery, and from there his life just unraveled. All the arguments for the faith he once embraced and preached, this needs to be said, all the arguments for the faith that he once embraced and preached meant nothing the moment he first cheated on his wife. And with every act of adultery that continued after that, well, his faith just continued to erode and weaken. Now, of course, he insisted, he told me over and over, that none of that had anything to do with his intellectual objections to Christianity. Really? Perhaps. But I would say that in order to justify his actions, he had to find a way to discredit the gospel itself, and in the end, simply claim that the evidence was too little and too weak. Not enough evidence, God, not enough evidence. For people like this, we can assume that even a glowing cross in the sky would not bring them to their knees. In reality, this former pastor rejected the faith the moment he first jumped into bed with that coworker, not through any intellectual pursuit. And that rejection was then formalized and set in concrete when he continued to violate his marriage vows Um, and refused to repent from the extramarital sex, continuing with it, and then divorcing his wife. He divorced her and became even more solidified when he went on to deny Christ before the whole world, as in publishing all those books and speaking in various venues, debunking the faith and the gospel, denying the power and grace of our Lord, and claiming that the salvation Christ gave his life for is nothing more than a big hoax. Serious stuff. There are many, we run into them all the time, who are so committed to their sin or their position or their lifestyle or whatever it might be that nothing will convince them. Nothing will bring them to repentance. They don't want the truth and they are not open to it regardless of how persuasive it may be. It is not because God isn't willing to reach into their lives. It is because their hearts are so hard that they will refuse any any grace that he offers them. As Jesus hung on the cross during his last hours, a number of religious leaders gathered around him. You'll remember the scene, mocking him, saying, if you are the son of God, save yourself. We remember that. But it goes on. If you are the son of God, save yourself. 
Come down from the cross and we will then believe. Really? Some of the emptiest words ever spoken. Three days later, he rose from the dead, and even that did not move them to believe. In contrast, a Roman centurion, who was also at the foot of the same cross, seeing everything the same way, and saw, um, saw everything those Jewish leaders saw, was moved from unbelief to belief. Surely this man was the Son of God. So I'll say it yet again, the problem isn't the evidence. The problem is one's disposition toward the evidence. And this leads us now to the last assumption, number four, that it is God's highest priority to convince everyone to believe in him. And at first, this kind of seems to be the case. It's, it has come a ring of truth to it, doesn't it? I'm sure we've all been conditioned to think this way. But again, it's based on a faulty understanding of God's will. Certainly, he does want people to believe in him. He does want everyone to obey him. He sent his son to die for the sins of the whole world. He loves everyone and wants everyone to respond to his offer of forgiveness. But he's not willing to get our belief in him, much less our love and obedience, at any cost. It is not, of course, his highest priority. If it were his highest priority, then all he would have to do is merely strong arm us into it. Maybe jab us with the electric cattle prods if necessary. When we look through the scriptures, we see that God honors and he values our free will. He's not eager to barge into people's lives with his overwhelming presence and impose himself on us. We could even assume that he might want to, like to do that, but he restrains himself so as to bring about a greater good. He has provided more than ample evidence and reasons for people to come to faith and finds a greater value in them choosing to do so out of genuine desire than just being backed into a corner with no other option. If the unbeliever is resolved in his unbelief, then God will respect that. If the sinner is resolved to continue in his path of sin, God will respect that choice. And if someone won't believe in the gospel because he complains that the evidence isn't enough, well, God will respect that complaint as well. Simply put, he treats us like we're adults, adults who stand by our decisions and take responsibility for those decisions. Though we greatly abuse it, he values the personal liberty he has given us. Otherwise, he would jab us with the electric cattle prods, but he doesn't do that. Assumption number four also implies that God is content with mere belief, as in you know, agreeing that he exists and that the gospel is true. But as we know, that isn't the goal at all. James says that even demons believe this kind of stuff. What God longs for is what follows belief, or at least should follow, and that is a relationship with us, our willful and loving submission to him, willful and loving, and joy-filled gratitude for him, for everything he has richly blessed us with. Imagine for a moment badgering a person to marry you, and then they eventually cave in and do so, but their heart really isn't in it. Rather, they have agreed to be your spouse because they felt like it was their only option. How rewarding would that be? Anyone in a marriage like that? Be quiet over there. <laughs> in the same way, God wants more than just compliant subordinates. He wants sons and daughters. Sons and daughters who want to draw close to him, delight in him, and resemble him. Sons and daughters who are filled with his very spirit and are one with him. The harsh judgment of those who are lukewarm in Revelation 3 is enough to show us that God abhors mediocrity and desires his people to be filled with his, with his fullness, as Paul prayed in Ephesians, to have life and to have it in him abundantly. And so there's far more going on here than simply agreeing, okay, okay, you got me, Christianity is true, I guess I have to admit it. That's not the goal. This being transformed into his image, drawing closer to him in our daily walk is something the Bible tells us to hunger and thirst for, to seek out with all of our hearts, to long for with great desire. If it is worth anything, then it is worth the time and effort to chase after. And it pleases our Lord to know that we value it enough to pursue it and to pursue it with great fervency. So in that sermon that Nate gave um, years ago, he brought up a great point. That given the claims of the gospel, it falls on everyone to search out its validity with the greatest of fervency. Indeed, there's nothing greater that one could be searching for. And the fervency of a search will be directly proportional to the importance of the item that is being sought after. And what's greater than this? 
You know, I might spend 20 minutes looking for a lost glove. I'll spend a lot longer than that looking for a lost set of car keys. Recently, fans of Taylor Swift have searched desperately, long and hard, and with great effort for tickets to one of her concerts. <clears throat> Parents will exhaust all of their resources in search of a lost child. And so the question is, what with the question is, with what intensity should we seek out God? Is there anything else in life that matters compared to such a search? And we should press on, even with faced with obstacles, doubts, and frustration, because this is what God values, to see that he is, to us, worth it. <clears throat> but there's even more going on here in all of this. There is a sense in which God seems to hide himself so that we'll make decisions without it feeling like he is constantly hovering over us. And this can be illustrated with a simple scenario of the county sheriff visiting the local tavern. I love this illustration. The sheriff pulls up to the front door with his government-issued police car with all of its lights flashing, barges in, dressed up in full uniform with his gun hanging on his side, and the moment he walks in, what happens? The chemistry in the room immediately changes, and things become even more stifled when he walks about from table to table, sizing up all the patrons. His overwhelming presence is intimidating, and people are not acting their true selves. The heated argument at the pool table immediately stops. Gun, uh, guys are not making rude advances to the women. The drinking itself drastically slows down. Even the loud use of profanity is curtailed. In fact, the decibel level itself overall just drops significantly. The bartender is now very careful about not serving anyone without first seeing their driver's license, and so on and so on. Do the people there really want to behave this way? No, they are frightened, if you will, into acting good. Now, if the sheriff wants to know how things really go on, go on inside the tavern, he has to somehow hide himself, drive up in an unmarked car, park in the back row, wear plain clothes, don't display his gun, walk in with you know, a group of others, five or six friends, act like everybody else in there, act naturally. So if God were to put a big cross in the sky, or if he were to strike blasphemers with lightning bolts, or barge into each of our lives with grandiose miracles and so forth, well, we would amount to the same thing. He would merely frighten us into acting good. And this, of course, would probably make the world a better place to live in, but it would not satisfy God's higher purposes. You know, what is the real worth of obedience if it isn't prompted by a true desire? Parents who see their children acting good when the children don't know that they're being watched, well, is there a greater joy than that? God gives enough proof and evidence to substantiate that he does exist and that the Christian faith is true. He does not, however, overwhelm us with it so that it merely becomes an electric prod by which to intimidate us into submission. So, to summarize what we've covered this morning... People assume that the evidence for the Christian faith is too little and too weak. Fact, there is more than enough evidence. More than enough. We've been through it this whole summer. The problem isn't with the evidence, but with one's disposition toward that evidence. Secondly, people also assume that without absolute proof, it would be foolish to believe. Well, actually, just the opposite is true. Given the consequences of rejecting Christianity, it is foolish not to believe not to mention the foolishness of expecting perfect proof, which is virtually impossible for anything. Number three, people assume that the evidence were more impressive than everyone would believe. Well, that's not the case. There are countless of examples of people seeing amazing miracles and yet refusing to submit to the gospel. They remain blinded by their stubborn commitment to their sinful behavior or pride or position or whatever it might be. And four, people assume that God's highest priority is to convince everyone to believe in him. Well, he could easily do that if he wanted to, but that isn't his highest goal. He wants us to come to him freely out of a genuine desire to do so, not because we have been coerced into it by his overwhelming presence. So in conclusion, this, this kind of needs to be said. The God of the Bible may seem to be hidden, and in some ways we could say that that is the case. But he has revealed himself. That revelation is both sufficient and it is compelling. He does not reveal himself to us for egotistical reasons or to satisfy any inner need for our fame 
um, or any name, any need for, or to satisfy any inner need for fame or worship, that he reveals himself at all is only for our benefit, not for his. He, that he reveals himself at all is only for our benefit, not for his. And so let us be grateful for what he has revealed, because it is more than enough. So let's stand, and I'll conclude with these rich words from Paul to Timothy. God has saved us, and he has called us to a holy life, not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time, but it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who has destroyed death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. May God bless his holy, infallible, and life-giving word. And you are dismissed. Go in Christ's name, enjoy each other, and serve each other in love.